This is part two of our section on Jainism. I want to take a chance to talk about this symbol a little bit. Uh, it's a very complex religious symbol, the Jain symbol. Um, in it, we have an uh, open hand, which is a symbol of peace. It's also a, a symbol or a mudra, a hand gesture of teaching. And in the center is written a Sanskrit word, and it's the word um, ah ahimsa, which, as we've talked about, means nonviolence, right? So that's the central tenet of Jainism, nonviolence. Um, above here, we have the very famous swastika, which we've talked about several times. For the Jains, and specifically in this, um, in this symbol, the swastika represents samsara, it represents the illusionary world that we're uh, in which we're stuck, that cycle of, of death and rebirth, that's something that we have to break out of. So, um, it, uh, as I mentioned before, the swastika has a lot of different um, meanings in in Asia, including um, good luck, but in this case, it's it's something. It's a representation of of um, everything we have to get out of. Above that are these three dots. The three dots represent insight, knowledge, and conduct. These are the three cornerstones of of being a good Jane, right? Having insight into yourself, being able to look at yourself clearly, look at the world clearly, knowledge, um, knowing and understanding the world and uh, conduct, you know, the way we, the way you act on your knowledge and your insight. Above that, finally, is this little crescent. It's this actually, it looks like a half circle. It actually represents a moon um, and a little dot in the middle. And that represents, the little crescent moon represents the highest um, region of the universe, the highest um, place in the universe. And that little dot is a soul, as a, a jiva that has uh, attained um, that position by, by reaching liberation, by reaching perfection. So that is the, the complex symbol of, um, of the Jains. Um, so in this lecture, we're going to talk more about practices. We're going to talk about the Jain monastic orders. Uh, we're going to talk about um, the way lay people practice. And we're going to talk a little bit about the complexity of balancing ideals and practice. And this is something that we're going to come back to in every uh, single religion one way or another. The fact that um, you're going to find that, that uh, we're, going to study, we're going to study the ideals and the philosophy behind religions. And then we'll look at what people do and the way people struggle to attain those ideals um, and the way they, they achieve them and fail. And, and Jainism is an interesting religion to look at um, in this because um, clearly they uh, Jains have very strong um, ethical values and strong sense of personal responsibility to conduct themselves in a certain manner. Um, so we're going to look at the way that works. Um, so I want to take a moment to talk a little bit more about um, prax and dox. We talked before about orthodox religions, orthoprax religions. Um, even though uh, Jainism is does not have as complex a system of yoga and practices, it still is very much an orthoprax religion. It's about the way you conduct yourself. And it's very much less about um, the, the faith or doctrine. Number one, because one of the cornerstones of um, Jainism is this idea of non-absolutism, that we can't know everything. Um, and there's not a strong belief in God or gods. That being said, um, Jains, Jainism uh, evolved out of Hinduism. Most Jains live alongside Hindus in India. And you'll find that um, a lot of Jains uh, do, carry out, do carry on uh, uh, Hindu practices as well. They may go to, um, they may go to temples and, and do puja for, for different deities. They may um, have an altar at home uh, and do puja. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so it's not it's not strictly one or the other. And it's really interesting because we're going to see that increasingly as we as we add on religions to our Asian section of this class. You're going to see that for for most um, Asian people, um, there's not really a need to choose one religion over all others. Um, it's possible to to identify as one and 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 practice your your tradition, but also practice others as well. We're especially going to see that in, in China and Japan when we study those countries. We study um, Taoism, Confucianism, and, and Shinto. So um, when we see pictures today, I want you to consider, um, you know, where Hindu elements are coming in, 
um, Hindu influences are, and we'll have a chance later on to um, read a, a news article and watch a video um, about modern day Jains, and uh, you're going to see that they that there are a lot of practices that are they're going to seem very Hindu um, because they are right. Jainism is is definitely it's a part of Hinduism in a lot of ways. Okay, so that being said. Let's um, start by looking at the ascetic orders, the, the, the monastic orders. Um, Jainism is practiced in its fullest by monks and nuns. So lay people um, do their best to carry out all the vows and, and um, the ideals of Jainism. But people uh, who want to embrace it fully and really live that life um, usually become monks and nuns. And as I've mentioned, I don't, there may be a priesthood in Jainism. I don't know of it though. Um, so um, monks and nuns uh, carry the principle of nonviolence to the extent that they'll wear these gauze masks, like this yogi here, pictured here, um, to avoid inhaling insects or microbes or anything else. Um, they avoid swimming and bathing uh, in water to avoid harming any, you know, again, any tiny um, creatures that they call them water bodies, any tiny creatures that might live in the water. They avoid eating after dark. Um, there's a section in your book, um, a very nice interview with a man who um, who talks about how he and his wife avoid eating after dark because that's when um, so many creatures come out, especially insects and things. Um, uh, they might accidentally harm them or inhale them or eat them. Um, and keep in mind as well that, you know, traditionally most in, in the past when people didn't have electric lights, when, when things got dark at night, things were just dark. You might have a fire or something, but things were just still very dim. So there, there was a need to um, uh, avoid uh, being overly active at night because you could harm um, different creatures that come out at that time. Um, Jains have to avoid digging. They have to avoid starting or extinguishing fire because from the, in the Jain philosophy, fire as is a, a fire body. A fire is 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 a, is a very particular kind of life. Um, they avoid fanning so as to avoid hurting insects and things. They avoid um, walking or touching live plants um, to the extent that um, a good Jane should try to avoid picking fruit from a plant but rather wait for the plant to drop the fruit itself. Um, so a number of different ways um, uh, Janes avoid um, doing harm and obviously this is like this is a very difficult lifestyle it's very difficult to to carry all these things so again if you want to practice this in its fullest extent if you really want to live the lifestyle um, Jains will become monks or nuns um, Jain monks and nuns are celibate uh, they spend a lot of time fasting not eating too much or, or avoiding eating or drinking water doing penance to um, make up for uh, sins they've committed and karma they've built up um, and they learn to endure hardships with indifference and it's an important part of being a Jain just like Mah uh, Mahadira who um, uh, you know endured so much um, torture and, and, and um, different things from, from people while he was trying to attain enlightenment it's an important part for Jains is just learning to, to bear your hardship and bear um, the physical discomforts that come um, with being a, a Jain monk or nun. Now there are two different groups of um, ascetics, ascet there are two ascetic orders rather in Jainism. There are the Dika, the Dika Ambaras and the Svetambaras. Um, the Dika Ambaras are the um, oldest of or the older of the two orders. Um, they follow uh, stricter rules. Um, they um, carry brooms with them that are made from the fallen feathers of peacocks, which are common in India. And they uh, they brush the ground before uh, as they're walking to avoid stepping on anything. Um, they, um, they have stricter rules about what they wear. In fact, um, they call themselves sky clad because dikambaras um, are are always naked. Right, they don't want to be attached to anything at all. I told you the story of um, Bahubali, who um, was attached to the idea that he was standing on his brother's land, and because of that, he couldn't reach enlightenment. Right, so there's this idea that that anything at all, any items, any stuff, 
can hold you back from reaching uh, liberation. So uh, they um, are completely naked. We'll see a couple pictures today, nothing too graphic. We'll see a couple pictures today. Um, and in India, this is kind of understood. It's kind of accepted. Um, these are Jains. But there are so few um, of the Dikambaras. I want to say there are maybe only a few hundred. Um, l definitely less than a thousand in the world. Um, and I, my understanding is that, you know, they, they keep very much to themselves and they, they're not, they're not really going to be found in cities and places like that. So, um, uh, they tend to avoid public and whatnot. Um, but they, they do not wear clothing. Um, the other thing that uh, distinguishes the Digambaras is they have a really strict understanding of the, about women. Women cannot achieve nirvana. Um, women can be mon or m women can be nuns rather. They can be Jain nuns, and that will help them achieve a better um, a better uh, incarnation next time around. But women, uh, they believe, are just not able to to uh, attain the same spiritual perfection as, as men can. So for Jane woman, the thing to do is to um, is to meditate and to conduct yourself rightly and then um, in the next life be incarnated as a man. The Svetambaras are, are the white clad. We have pictures of some Svetambara uh, nuns right here. You see they're meditating. Um, so the story goes that um, all the monks and nuns live together um, in a region of India and that uh, there was a, a famine and that some of the, the monks and nuns moved south to avoid the famine and some remained. When the ones who had left came back, they found that the, the, the uh, members who had been left behind had changed many rules, right? So they reformed and changed certain things about um, the Jain monastic order. Um, and they're the Svetambaras. They, um, wear white, they wear white cloth, which is... Um, Again, we learned in Hinduism uh, is a very humble color. It's a, it's a plain color. It's the color of um, shrouds that, that bodies are wrapped in before they're cremated. Um, so it's it's a symbol of humility. But they uh, they do um, they are clad. Um, they are much more common. Um, there are um, and especially amongst women, there are. I think there must be four or six times as many Svetambara um, nuns as Dikambara nuns. My math is right. Um, because clearly it's, it's, it's a little bit easier to get by in society, right, when you uh, can um, be fully clothed. Um, and they do believe that women can teach nirvana. Uh, Svetambaras have a number of um, uh, very famous Jain, uh, very famous women teachers and leaders and so they're more open in that sense um, but they also they do sweep the ground before they walk in and they do follow much of the the rest of the the, the uh, non-violence um, rules that the Digambara um, follow so those are the two ascetic orders um, so again Jainism is practiced by its fullest by monks nuns lay people which is just regular people like you and me um, regular members of the, the religious community. Um, they just do their best to seek very simple lives. And again, the book has this wonderful um, interview. It's on page 132. Right? Page 132. Right there. Uh, interview with M.P. Jane. And, he, he, and I think he does a really wonderful job of the way uh, of showing how um, Jainism fits into his life. Um, so Jains try to keep their homes scrupulously clean, right? There's a couple things going on there. First, they want to keep out bugs and vermin and other things that they might um, accidentally hurt. But also, um, there is, uh, for Jains, pur purity is a strong ideal, right? You want to keep things pure and clean. Um, it represents, you know, a, a clean life um, or a clean soul. Um, they're very strict vegetarians. Increasingly, a lot of young um, Jains are becoming vegan as well uh, and uh, encouraging others to become vegan uh, because they take issue with the way animals are treated on farms and things like that. Um, they avoid medicines that, um, that uh, have been tested on animals. No, nothing that has been tested on animals um, or, have, or clearly, obviously, have any, has any sort of animal product in it. 
um, on a daily basis, they practice a ritual called Samayika, which means which is a uh, purification. Again, the book does a, uh, has a section on on page 127. I just want to read a part of it. So purification involves um, m uh, meditating in the evening. And then uh, they do a, a series of chants. And we'll see in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, chants and mantras are really important. The chant that they use uh, goes like this. I ask forgiveness of all beings. May all beings forgive me. I have friendship with all beings and I have hostility towards none, with none. Right, so first there's, a, there's uh, an intention right, towards all beings and, and a desire for forgiveness, which we're gonna see comes up a lot in Jainism. Then they reach out mentally, they reach out to all life forms. And they say friendship towards all beings, delight in the qualities of virtuous ones, utmost compassion for affected beings, equanimity towards those who are not well disposed towards me. May my soul have such dispositions forever. Right? We offer friendship towards everyone, happiness and delight towards the good, compassion for those who are suffering, and equanimity, so so no anger or, and and no resentment towards those who are um, not well disposed towards those who hate me, right? And again, this goes um, this is um, well reflected in the story of Mahadira. And they follow um, follow a number of verses that commit persons commit them to renouncing food, bodily desires, and passions for a period of meditation, persistent equanimity, come what may. And then they end it with universal chain prayer, cessation of sorrow, cessation of karmas, death while in meditation, attainment of enlightenment, a holy jina, friend of the entire universe, let these be mine, for I have taken refuge at your feet. Um, so um, cessation of sorrow and karmas are kind of self-explanatory. This death while in meditation is an interesting, is an interesting one. A lot of uh, Jains uh, practice meditation at the very end of their lives. And in fact, there is a practice um, called Salikana, um, which is uh, fasting unto death. Um, it's not considered suicide by the Jains. It is done in very specific, very specific circumstances. When someone is very, very elderly, when someone has a terminal illness, when they're suffering from famine, when there's some other calamity, basically when death is coming, when death is at your door, um, you kind of you 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 go out um, in a, in a meditative state and you fast um, and and you wait um, to pass away. And for Jains, that's that's considered a really um, a spiritual way of ending their lives. Um, so again, it's not considered suicide by the Jains because it's done in situations where the person is already at death's door. Um, and again, it, and it, it builds up a lot of merit, which, which counteracts karma. Um, and then they call on the jina, um, which, is, which are the enlightened beings or the, the, those who have reached nirvana or moksha already. Um, oh, holy jina, friend of the entire universe, let me be mine for I've taken refuge at your feet. Um, so it's, um, as I mentioned before, uh, you can ask help of the jina, of the, uh, the Tutankaras. You can ask help of these, but you shouldn't always, you shouldn't expect it, right? This is all on you ultimately. It's on you to, to conduct yourself rightly and to um, find perfection yourself. But a lot of Jains would feel, would argue that it doesn't hurt to, to it doesn't hurt to ask it never hurts to ask um, so that is um, that is the nightly ritual that Jains do they don't do puja at home with an altar some may some may that's their choice but Jainism doesn't require them to do that Jainism does expect you to do this purification ritual every evening so um, those are some of the practices I try to find a picture of the uh, Samakika, but I couldn't find anything um, really. It honestly is just Jane's just meditating, sitting in meditation. This picture here, you can tell it's it's the daytime from the lighting, but it would look very similar to this. Um, yes, let's see here. Um, and again, 
personal effort is tantamount in all of this. So um, there are a number of vows, a good number of vows that um, you take when you enter the monastic order. Here's some more um, women, some more nuns of, um, the, of the white clad um, sect. It's not a great picture, I apologize. Um, but um, I liked it because it showed um, them with their, their gauze masks and also showed them smiling. It sounds like a really strict religion, but these are, these are happy people. They are uh, attaining personal peace. Um, they are being unattached to the world and uh, they are very content. Um, there are 12 limited vows, 12 smaller vows for lay people. Um, and of these 12 vows, uh, the first five are the most important. Nonviolence, truthfulness, not taking anything that has not been given, renouncing sexual activity outside of marriage, and limiting one's possessions. See, that last one is, is probably the hardest in the modern world. Um, so uh, these are the things that um, Jains should, should strive for in their lives. Um, and they're very similar to, to the rules you'll find in a lot of religions. But like I say, Jainism does have a lot of lists, it has lots of lists of things to do and not do. So um, there are a number of festivals and pilgrimages that Jains take. Pilgrimages in particular are very important to the, to the Jain religion. Um, a lot of Jains celebrate the same festivals as the Hindus do. They celebrate Diwali, um, except they, um, they do a three-day fast during Diwali and they spend an entire night reciting hymns of meditating on Mahavira, who uh, attained uh, nirvana during Diwali. That's what, that's kind of the, the, the meaning of Diwali to a Jain is that Mahavira um, attained uh, a nirvana or, or moksha, if you will, at that time. Um, but they'll still set off fireworks and things like that, of course. A lot of their holidays are celebrated with meditation, um, vows of renunciation, fasting, scriptural study, hymns, down here we have a picture from Gyana pa, uh, Panchami. Uh, this is a this is a really interesting festival, a really interesting holiday. It is the fifth day after Diwali, and Jains take it as a day to worship pure knowledge. That's wonderful. As an academic, <laughs> as a professor, <laughs> you take it a day to worship knowledge. I kind of like that. Um, that's my holy envy there. Um, uh, so they take a day to, uh, they, most Jains are going to have a library at home or at least some place where they keep their books. Um, we're going to have a chance uh, after this lecture to look at some of the books and things that, that are available online for Jains, uh, the same kinds of things Jains would have at home. Um, so they, they take out the books, they clean them carefully, they get rid of all the dust and everything, being careful and being respectful to any mic microorganisms which might be on them. Um, and they read them, they meditate on them. And here's a picture here. You can see um, these are Jains. These are um, old fashioned books, essentially. They're, they're long strips of wood. I'm not sure what kind of wood it is with um, writing on them. You can see they're, they're going through them carefully and studying them. Um, so that is um, an important day or a unique, uh, especially unique holiday in Jainism. Um, their most important festival is called Pari, uh, Paryushan Mahaparva. It's an annual festival of atonement. Jewish religion has a day of atonement as well. Um, it is, an, uh, it is uh, recognized with an eight-day fast, so um, very, very simple eating, um, little water for eight days, um, and they seek forgiveness on, on during that time um, Jains are, are supposed to seek forgiveness for things th since they've committed that year. Um, they uh, do a lot of meditations, like the one we just talked about, the Jain purification, where, where they kind of mentally reach out to all beings and to anything they might have harmed inadvertently. They will go to um, people that they know, anyone they might have wronged that year, and, and beg for their forgiveness. Um, they spend a lot of time uh, meditating, praying, um, uh, studying. Um, and they do um, give offerings to, um, here you can see um, Mahavir, and here as well, they give offerings um, as a symbol, as, as a sign of their atonement, a sign of their repentance, right? Um, you can see here on the, the right are, are 
Jain lay people. They're, they, they're dressed just as, as Hindus um, dress. Um, and, on, and here we can see the, the white clad, the monks. Um, and this is a little, uh, a little shrine, a little altar area for uh, Mahavira. And they're giving him, hard to tell what it is they're giving him, but just wanted to give you a sense of what that looks like. Um, so this raises a question. This picture right here raises an interesting question. Are they worshiping Mahavira? Um, are they just venerating? Is it necessary in a religion um, that puts so much emphasis on right conduct and just being a good person? We're going to see this in Buddhism as well. Buddhism is very similar. Um, there's no need to worship the Buddha because the Buddha is just a person who has reached enlightenment already, not a god. So Mahavira is just the same. Um, but it is useful. You're going to in every religion, people find it useful to have these kinds of rituals, right? It's not just about um, pleasing, um, pleasing the god or getting or pleasing your Tutankara. Buddha, whoever, it's not about just getting help. It does something for people psychologically and, and socially to perform these rituals together. It's an acting out of one's ideals. It's an acting out of stories. It's an acting out of these intangible ideas that we hold dear, but maybe can't, maybe can't um, put our fingers around, you know? Um, and people find them, and people find them useful in every religion. People find them useful, regardless of how they believe them, whether they think they are, they work, they don't work, how they work. Um, are are they um, getting help? Are they just saying hi? Are they, um, you know, are they worshiping? Are they attaining uh, eternal salvation in heaven? They get there. There's a sense of of satisfaction that comes from acting these these ideals and stories and virtues out. And that's what they're doing there. Um, so it's something to consider with each religion we look at. Think about your tradition. I know a lot of people in class uh, come from a Christian background. Think about the, the way Christianity teaches worship services on Sunday and what that means. Um, and compare it and contrast it to um, some of the religions we're looking at now. Is it the same? Do they, do they is, is giving these offerings the same as um, you know singing hymns of praise in a in a Christian um, context. Um, how is it? How is it the same? How is it different? And uh, try not to look at these things too much through your own lens of experience, and try and consider their experiences and the way they look at it. Um, so that <laughs> tangential. That is the annual festival of atonement. Pilgrimages are also really important in Jainism. Um, they are, um, again, they're, they're a way of kind of physically acting out um, atonement and repentance by putting yourself under hardship because Jain a lot of Jainism is learning to endure hardship. Buddhism has a lot of pilgrimages in it, in it too. Um, here we can see uh, these women are, are basically walking up a mountain. They're, these are steps built into this mountain at the top of which is a um, is a giant uh, statue of Bahubali, who whose story whose life story is written in your book on page one twenty four, but he was one of the um, Tantankaras, and um, uh, you can see it's so large. The statue is so large that people will often just come and venerate his feet, right? And again, that's a sign of humility that that they just touch his feet. Um, these are sky-clad monks, you can tell very clearly, um, and these are white-clad monks, and these are just lay women, just normal women, who are coming um, to, um, to venerate here. And here's a smaller Bahubali here. You can see their, um, the brooms of, of falling peacock feathers that they use to, to sweep the ground as they're, before they step on it. You can see people have left um, flowers here, people will pour um, offerings on his feet, um, precious oils, milk, um, other things like that. But once every 12 years, there's this huge Jain festival called Mahamastaka Vishika. Mahamastaka, Mahamastaka Vishika. Um, and, it, and it venerates Bahubali. And you can see um, every 12 years, they build this huge scaffolding and they pour all of these offerings all over the image of Bahubali. 
they pour rose water, they pour um, holy powder, they pour um, um, flower petals, all sorts of different things. It, it takes a long time and, and many, many people, you can't see how big the crowd is, but thousands of people will come and gather for this. Hindus as well as Jains, because um, Hindus um, respect Jainism, Hindus respect um, a, a good number of the these um, different offshoots of Hinduism. Um, and so they come and uh, there's this huge festival. You can see all the flowers, the flower petals that gather at his feet after they're all poured down and, and they decorate it and things like that. And it is, um, it is a huge deal. And there's lots of celebration, but there's also meditations as well and vows taken um, to uh, be better people in the future. So that is the largest uh, pilgrimages in India, outside maybe um, Shivratri. So um, Jainism hasn't spread that far outside of India. It's it's always been a minority religion. Um, clearly, it had it requires a lot of its followers. Though again, Hindus um, respect Jainism and 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 participate in, in Jain festivals and things like that still. It's always been a minority. Um, several There have been several teachers, gurus, who have taken Jainism to the world, and there have also been Jain immigrants who have traveled to North America. Um, there are approximately 12,000 uh, Jains living in North America. There's a community up in Chicago. Um, and you'll find a lot of times in these foreign communities, Jains and uh, live um, and worship very much with with uh, Hindu communities, right? So there just aren't a lot of Jains. Um, they can't form large communities. Um, so they, they join together with the Hindus a lot. Um, it has a lot of modern relevance increasingly um, with its emphasis on taking care of the environment, caring for all life, um, and uh, things like that. There is, um, the book talks about a university that was uh, founded by several Jains. Um, it is the, um, they call it the Tolerance and Peace, uh, they call it Tolerance and Peaceful Coexistence. Um, and there's this quote, I'll read it. I really like this quote. Um, it says, there's no dearth of universities and institutes throughout the world, right? They are fulfilling the aims of education by awarding degrees for getting jobs and orienting the students in the fields of science, arts, and commerce. Though this type of education leads to the advancement of science and technology and sharpens the intellect of students, it also increases the tendency of materialistic possession, which demands indiscriminate fulfillment of wants, leading to an erosion of rules, code of conduct, moral values, and the ethical content from human life. The prevalent educational system has inadvertently neglected character building and attainment of emotional balance, without which human beings, with all their high intellectual accomplishments, cannot coexist peacefully. So clearly the point of this um, university, uh, the Jain Vish Vishva Bharati Institute, um, is to try and spread these ideals, right? Just to take education beyond just getting a job and trying to make people better and uh, trying to create peace. Um, and as I mentioned, we're gonna, we'll talk more about interfaith programs at the end of this semester, but Jains have been very, very active in that. Um, one thing these, um, some of these organizations have done, such as the this Jain Institute, um, has uh, started a movement of an Anuvrat, the small vow movement, right? Lay people, Jain lay people, and monks and nuns have a, have a set of vows that they have to take. So um, uh, some Jains got together and they made this small vow mu movement. It is um, it is trying to spread um, or trying to get non-Jains to take certain vows in their lives. Um, vows, uh, for example, I have some written down here. Um, uh, vows to take care of the environment, vows to protect animal rights, a vow um, to be a vegan, a vow to be uh, nonviolent as much as possible, a vow to um, to reach out to members of other faiths and not discriminate towards people of other faiths and traditions. Um, and they've also initiated these these orders of semi monks and semi nuns who don't have to take 
as many vows as um, Jain monks and nuns do. So there's a sense that, um, again, their religion is about ethics, their religion is about treating other people well, and so there's this idea that, that these are that there's this recognition that a lot of these values are universal values, and these are things that can be spread to other people, not with uh, without asking them to convert to their religion, but rather just taking on the vows themselves, um, or taking on these ethics themselves. That's what's important. Um, I hope I've explained that clearly. Um, so. Um, there is this really interesting world Jain movement, but it's not its not a movement of conversion. It's not a movement of gaining numbers of members. Um, it's, a, it's a movement of trying to take these ethics and values and apply them to the modern world.